me let me start recording all right uh, we were looking at this normal ct scan uh, with contrast uh, we looked at the heart we mentioned that we are looking to, to the patient from the bottom so the right lung is here and the left lung is here so the things are getting opposite in a ct scan the same thing happens on a chest x-ray as well like when you're seeing a chest x-ray you are looking at the patient from from the front of the patient right from across the, uh, from uh like the patient is sitting right in front of you and looking at you so the things get opposite like the right side of the patient the right side of the image is actually the left side we we looked at the heart uh, we looked at the major vessels the right chambers and the left chambers the right chambers are getting the the blood from vena cava which is the inferior vena cava here and the superior vena cava here more on the top side and the left chamber is actually uh, pumping up the blood to aorta the aorta is making a making a sharp turn on the upper thorax which is the arcus aorta and from there it starts to go down and it goes down until the level of the iliac vessels like it goes down all the way through the abdomen one important thing in a ct scan is the pulmonary arteries we will come to this like i wanted to quickly mention you uh, what other things we see in a ct scan we see the heads of the humerus we see the scapula right uh, we see the vertebra and the costa uh, around here we don't see the pleural cavities because the pleural cavities do not exist but the pleurals are just some membranes which are rubbing up against each other there is no free fluid in the pleural sections and when we after we finish the heart when we start to go down we enter the abdominal cavity and it starts with two diaphragm one is accompanied by uh, the liver the other uh, we see the spleen right and the abdomen the abdomen goes to different directions we can check another abdomen scan if you want um, radiopedia is a very good website you can find any kind of disease any kind of radiological uh, examination for any type of disease so anything you want to examine just google it with the name radio radiopedia and it will show up so i will look at another image uh, another uh, examination of the abdomen this time so because we are looking at the abdomen we are looking at a darker level right the lungs are the lungs are completely dark so we are looking at the soft tissues only on the right side i have the liver on the left side uh, i have the spleen i'm talking the opposite right uh, we see the pancreas here this is the pancreas and between the organs there are there is fat abdominal fat and which is dark abdominal fat has low density so we can see the borders of the organs pretty easily on a CT scan. And when I, uh, I see also the aorta here, this is the aorta, right? It was, it made a round turn on the arcus and now it is coming down. It will come down in front of the vertebra all the way until it divides into two other vessels, which are the uh, iliac vessels, as you know. Uh, I'm going up again and uh, i'm going at the pancreas level uh, so we are at the pancreas level this uh, now one important thing is the gallbladder which is an important structure because of not because it's physiology but because it has many diseases like like uh, like gallstone disease and uh, such we see the gallbladder right below the liver right and on the right side on the left side of the vertebra we see the kidneys I'm going down and I started seeing small bubbles on the mid section of the abdomen. And on the sides, on the lateral sides and on the top, we see the colon. It starts with cecum, uh, cecum. It goes down, ascending colon. It goes all the way to liver and it makes a sharp turn here. 
and this is the transverse colon it goes up again it goes right next to spleen which we name it splenic flexura and from the splenic flexura it comes down and it comes down all the way into pelvic area in pelvis we see the iliac bones the right one and the left one here uh, the colon makes an S turn. It makes a turn like this, uh, which we call the sigmoid colon, right? Because it looks like sigma. And in the end, you go to rectum, and the rectum goes up to anus. Uh, in, on the front of the rectum, we see the bladder, which is very important for us because we look at the ultrasound of the pelvis from the bladder. We will come to that uh, in a minute. So uh, I'm, look, I'm coming down a little bit. Uh, we check the in small bowels. We check the large bowels, right? We check the colon. Uh, we followed up the aorta. We followed up the solid organs like kidney, spleen, spleen and liver, I'm sorry. And uh, we look at the pelvis now. We are at the pelvic level. Uh, in pelvis, we see the bladder. If the patient is a male, we see the prostate. If the patient is female, we see the uterus and the ovaries. We don't see them yet. And uh, that's pretty much it. That's what we have in an abdominal CT scan. In the very lower part, we see the femur. This is the right femur. This is the left femur. These are the pubic bones. And uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, does anybody have questions? It's not much, it's, there is not much to question here. Uh, anyway, uh, it was just an introduction and lect lectures for you. So in an ultrasound scan, we, we, will, we will be looking at the liver, we will be looking at the spleen, we will be looking at the kidneys, and we will be looking at the pelvic area in a fast ultrasound scan. So I, want to show, I wanted to show you a CT scan just in order to, uh, for you to uh, just not get lost in an ultrasound scan. We yes. Have, yes, please. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, at which level, at which level exactly did the aorta um, divide into two vessels? Like, excuse me, the aorta divides into two vessels, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now there is one. There's uh, the right thing here. I mean the the. This circle is a word, but I mean, there was two um, two vessels when uh -huh. we go uh, when we go deeper. Uh -huh. Can you just go? show them again? Can you just yeah, show them. All right, all right, sure. Well, by the way, look, aorta has a lot of branches, right? That's different. Like aorta has a lot of branches, like the carotis artery, the subclavians, the celiac trunk superior mesenteric inferior mesenteric right like renal arteries it has a lot of branches but it divides into two in the very end in the lower abdominal level so i'm uh, i'm I, I came to the up the lower thorax level i'm starting up from the beginning uh, following up aorta is very important by the way as you have seen like i'm uh, i'm really uh, teaching you this uh, like repeating this a lot of times so we are in thoracic aorta now, right? Uh, this is the, this is, I think this is the, oh, okay, this is the uh, superior, uh, inferior vena cava, sorry. This is the thoracic aorta, which is on, in front of the vertebra. And I'm following up down. As we are descending, the liver enters the scene, the spleen enters the scene. The aorta goes in front of the vertebra still. The first branch it gives, is the celiac trunk, which actually divides into uh, hepatic and splenic uh, vessels, right? Arteries. Uh, the second branch it gives is the splenic uh, artery, and it starts to give renal arteries, by the way. This is another renal ar uh, artery out uh, outlet. I'm still following it down. We came to the level of the kidneys now. Now I'm still coming down and it gives the inferior mesenteric artery somewhere around there i think uh, no this is the superior one anyway uh, we i won't be asking you this it is pretty much detailed but if i follow the aorta down 
it will come down a little bit more and later it divides into two the right and the left iliac arteries and right and the left iliac arteries also divides into two which is the external iliacs and the internal the internal iliacs and the external iliacs and these go down to form the the femoral arteries right it goes down to legs uh, i'm coming back again these are the iliac vessels they go up 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 and they uh, originate from the aorta was it clear you want me to show again thanks no uh, it's all, clear, right. Thanks. all right okay now because i give you a pretty much of an introduction uh, before ultrasound lecture is that in in an ultrasound scan we will be looking at the patient from from like a the camera right it's something like a mouse so wherever you put your probe it shows you only this area so it it is very it, it's much easier to get lost in an ultrasound scan like you really have to know where you're looking at and uh, i wanted to show you this orientation so if i am actually let's say if I'm looking at the patient from here, if I put the probe here, so it will have an image like this, pretty much like this. So the liver will be on the front, the kidneys will be on the back, right? So uh, I will go down a little bit. So if I put my probe uh, here this time, okay. I put my probe here, right? So it will have an image roughly like this. Sorry, roughly like this. So on the front, we will see the liver. And on the back side, we will see the lung, the pleura. So wherever you put your probe, it shows something different. So if I put my probe here, It will show something like this. And by the, by the way, this will be like this because we will be seeing it on the screen, right? So on the front, we will be seeing the spleen, for example. And on the back, we will be seeing the kidney. And here we will be seeing the pleura, like the lung. So uh, we will get pretty much familiar with these images uh, i will let me show you the uh, pelvic level as well we also we will look at the pelvic uh, ultrasound as well so when we when we look at the image from a transverse axis like this like this so it will roughly show something like that like the, uh, pretty much similar so on the front we will see the bladder like a circle and on the back there will be abdominal organs like bowels this and that and uh, the bowels are not going to show up like this of course this is a ct scan and that's an ultrasound scan so it shows different anyway but uh, uh yeah that's pretty much it i want to tell you uh, so our orientation like where we look at the uh, patient and uh, what we see is very uh, pretty much related with where we put the image so uh, please try to orient yourselves uh, for using CT scans. Uh, they are very helpful because it shows you all the volume like you can look at anywhere. Uh, when I was looking at thorax CT scans, it really taught me a lot on chest X-rays, for example. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, we have an ultrasound uh, lecture to go. Uh, this, uh, I, I don't have a corporate version of uh, Zoom, so we are approaching the uh, meeting limit now i will send you another link we will follow we will let's go there and start the ultrasound lecture uh, i will not be giving any uh, breaks does anybody need a break okay so i will be sending you the link uh, right away uh, okay see you there all right okay uh, no, thanks no, no. issue mm, we have been talking about the ultrasound uh, we we uh, looked at the human hearing range uh, and ultrasound is the 
the higher frequencies levels that uh, other than the uh, like above the human hearing range. We checked the technological advancements in uh, ultrasound technology. Uh, like I'm not, these are not going to come to you as a question, so I was just telling you in order for you to know it. Uh, the basic fundamental rules of ultrasound is that the sound travels at a uh, constant speed and it goes in a constant direction, which are actually not true because the sound waves actually uh, travels at different speeds and sound waves also disperse, we have talked. So the image has a lot of artifacts, things, imperfections, as we have called. Like when there is gas, we are not seeing anything uh, because the machine simply cannot uh, compute. Also, uh, the image is a lot, producing a lot of imperfections, like when there's a cystic lesion, for example, behind these cystic lesions, things sh show brighter, which are actually not. They show up as brighter images. Also, one thing I have uh, forgot to mention is that these we are using ultrasound probes with uh, piezo crystals. Piezo crystals. So these piezo crystals have different frequencies. And the lower frequencies penetrate deeper, where the higher frequencies, they cannot penetrate deeper. They, If the image has high frequency, like 13 megahertz, it goes only 6 centimeter, but it has higher resolution. So when you're looking at a tyrant, for example, you don't look at it with a convex probe. Like convex probe with lower frequency is for abdomen. Like it doesn't show up the small nodules that we need to see. For small things, we use higher frequencies. And that was pretty much it. We covered up everything very fastly. Uh, and this was another artifact in ultrasound where there was a stone in gallbladder. And behind the gallbladder, there is a huge shadow because the sound waves simply cannot penetrate through uh, the stone. So the ultrasound has a lot of modes, we call them. There is A mode, B mode, M mode, this, that. They are not necessary. I won't be asking to you these questions in the exam. There are two basic things we will use in ultrasound. One is the grayscale image, which is the B mode, actually. And there is a color image. And I'm not going to ask you some letters, OK? Don't uh, be sure of that. We use grayscale and we use color for blood flow. That's all. So uh, let's see. Uh, I will ask you a question, all of you. Uh, you are in the emergency department and they admit a patient with an ambulance, okay? It's a 20-year-old uh, woman which fell from the balcony. And they say they had arrest inside the ambulance and they did CPR for three minutes. You look at the, uh, you look at the blood pressure, it's very low and the patient has tachycardia, you know, the heart is pumping very fast. The patient has raccoon eyes like very dark eyes, which are actually like bleeding uh, on the on the bottom. So what is the course of action? Like what is the first thing that pops up in your mind in a setting like that? What is the first thing that you should do? Somebody called CT. What else? What else? Well, simply, simply you, you, you look at the ABC, right? Like you never forget the first rule. First rule is always first. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, Yunus, Yunus actually nailed it. Uh, you, you check the ABC. You look for the airway, you look at the patient has spontaneous breathing, you look for the circulation. So first things always comes first. Then afterwards, you need to evaluate the patient. If the patient has any bleeding, if the patient has any pneumothorax or any, uh, or this and that. So you have to check for the actual injuries, right? So there is something that the emergency, the, the phys physicians working in emergency use a lot, which is the fast examination. It is called, it is it is uh, actually focused assessment with sonography for trauma. It counts for. Uh, it's a point of care ultrasound examination. So you do it right next to the patient. You don't carry it anywhere else. Performed at the time of presentation of trauma patients. So you are actually checking the ABC. Somebody is uh, doing the blood work, this or that. And somebody else can come with the ultrasound machine, with the portable machine, and look at the the focused areas and look for major bleeding in the potential uh, cavities of the body. 
So it has a reporting sensitivity of it very high reporting sensitivity for detecting intraperitoneal free fluid, which is bleeding in uh, the abdomen. So it has four different four classic areas for, to use fast ultrasound. Uh, you look at the perihepatic space. You look around the liver. You look around the spleen. You look around the heart, and you look at the pelvis uh, from the bladder. So if you check these four areas, it has a very high uh, uh, sensitivity for detecting hemorrhage cases. Okay. Also, there is something called EFAST, uh, which is, stands for the extended uh, version of this. And, and in that uh, case, you add pneumothorax examination by ultrasound as well. So these are the areas you check, basically, in uh, EFAST ultrasound. Uh, first, you check the upper uh, right upper quadrant uh, for liver, and you look at the peritoneal fluid, and you also look at the peritoneal fluid, uh, pleural fluid as well, because the lungs are there too, right, on the back side. Uh, on the left side, you check the spleen and the pleura again. For for checking the heart, you cannot check the heart from here because you have the sternum here, so you have to look right like below the sternum and you have to like make an angle to look at the uh, heart and you can see the pericardium if the patient has any pericardial bleeding and for the bottom part you look at the pubic area around the bladder to see any peritoneal um, free fluid and on the top side in order to check pneumothorax you have to look from here right in this area so uh, let's go over them uh, with looking at these images uh, please uh, please do not care about ultrasoundidiots.com uh, writing down there uh, it's a very nice website by the way uh, very very nice images so the first one i i told uh, was let's this started from the pericardial area when you put the image here on the subcusifoid and the, the probe here, uh, and you look at you ang you make a certain angle, you see you can see the heart beating and you can see the liver on f in front of it actually. So this is a normal image. When you look at the subcusifoid area, you see something like this. And when there is a free fluid around the heart a little bit, the heart starts to shake a little bit, and you can see the free fluid in front of. The heart unlike this one which it was just to uh, the uh, heart walls and and that's it here we have small amount of fluid right when the when the fluid just increases it it can be seen better of course and uh, the heart will start to swim uh, just uh, in that uh, the next area we we look at the right upper quadrant so we see the liver here when you look at the right side and on and be and behind the liver you see uh, the kidneys right and these are the solid organs you see but also on the top of that uh, we are seeing also the the lung which is here because the lung has air inside like it is completely dark the lung is going to be very dark but like not like complete dark but very dark a little bit uh, like heterogeneous and we can see the the pleura lining shining because the pleura is because the pleura has very small bubbles it usually uh, has small small irregularities like this uh, when there is free fluid inside this area uh, okay, we will come to that. In this case, there is free fluid around the uh, liver, and uh, it looks like this. It usually looks uh, quite dark, not completely dark when there is bleeding. Uh, so the, the liver starts to swim. Let's check out this one. So below the liver, there is some bleeding, like we can see that the dark uh, fluid which is surrounding the liver. 
Also here there is some very f small amount of fluid around the kidney as well, but it's yeah, like millimetric, very very minute. Okay. Now there is free fluid on the top of the liver, like it shows like this. And when there is fluid inside pleura, like in the thoracic cavity, now it looks like this. Now the it's it is now the lung which is swimming inside the fluid, right? It looks different. And I can see the diaphragm here also. The diaphragm is here, so it is limiting the fluid, and the lung is here. It start to fl uh, flow down, and the, the fluid is uh, running around the lung this time. Now we have come to the left side. Uh, the spleen is smaller, right? Uh, much smaller than the uh, liver, but it, it pretty much looks the same. Uh, we, we see the left kidney and the spleen, and on the top of the spleen we see the same pleural lining, which is which is now the left lung. Uh, now, can you see the abnormality now? We are. I'm seeing free fluid around the spleen. The spleen is running, uh, swimming inside uh, the fluid. And this time, I'm seeing the spleen as a separate as 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 it is. Uh, this is the stomach. It's hard to see, but we are seeing the lung this time, like the shiny lung, which is swimming inside a uh, pleural cavity. Okay. So when we come to downside uh, for looking at the pelvis, we look at this this area, like we look at the. Uh, suprapubic area and when I put the probe like this as a sagittal axis it shows like uh, it has an image like this and uh, the let me stop here the bladder is here in fact this is the bladder because it has fluid inside it just looks like bleeding right it's very dark but of course it's not bleeding like it's like inside a sack now so on the top of that we see the bubble walls because the bowel walls have air inside, as I have told you, it shows like a darkness, but pretty much a heterogeneous one, not like a fluid like this. So this is a normal examination. And if I have the image probe here, then it starts to look like a CT scan, like we have seen. On the mid side, we, had the, we see the bladder as a round structure. Uh, and uh, around the bladder, like every the fluid is contem uh, contained, it's inside the sac. There is nothing swimming around. When there's free fluid inside the pelvic, it is that easy to see. Like now, you start to see the bowel walls swimming inside, right? And when I look at the uh, the other axis, like uh, transverse axis, so around this sac now, I start to see. Uh, fluid which has swimming bubble walls inside can you roughly understand by the way how the situation yeah, sorry doctor you said that uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's similar the fluid in the bladder uh, it look, looks like bleeding so how can we differentiate be between the fluid of the bladder and the bleeding well uh, I mean if you look at this for example uh, there is fluid inside the sac, right? Because this is the bladder. And now the fluid outside the sac is going places completely different. Like one looks round and which is contained in a wall. But if I look at this, like the, I'm, inside there is fluid as well, which is dark, right? But there are bowels swimming inside this fluid. So, uh, like, can you, when you look at this, can you sort of uh, differentiate the free fluid? Yeah. Yes, it looks obvious. Yeah. yeah, this looks obvious, right? Like, you're going to, like, we are all going to get used to it. Uh, no worries. Like, this is the first time you're seeing an ultrasound image. So, this is the bladder. These are the bowels, right? And the bowels are swimming inside the fluid. So, uh, let me repeat it again. So I'm looking at the transverse image now. 
let me stop in the right moment okay so we are seeing the bladder like as i am moving the probe it looks it goes up and down right and around the bladder now i'm seeing the fluid density this is fluid density but inside it is there are bowels which is the same thing here as well like let's look at this image here so i'm seeing the so i'm sorry all right i'm seeing the liver here this is the liver right this is the diaphragm so there's fluid density here and the lungs are actually now swimming inside so like when i look at the image as, as a still image it's hard to see but when you see it moving it's much easier to see all right so we get used to it so we are looking at four different areas around the heart around the spleen around pelvis and we are trying to see bleeding okay this was a normal scan for the bladder and this was an abnormal scan for the bladder this was also an abnormal scan on a transverse level like a ct scan right so we are looking at the let's let's go to e fast all right let's forget about fast we are looking at the five levels so you look you look, you look around the uh, liver you look around the spleen you look at the pelvis you look around the cardiac the the heart and you look for uh, and you look for uh, pneumothorax pneumothorax detection is actually quite difficult something uh, it has different modes like when you go at the certification they are going to show you this in a different level and in a different with a different tactic uh, so this is the tactic i use uh, for detecting the pleura uh, this time i'm using the uh, linear probe so this area that we are seeing is actually like uh, the depth is actually six centimeters so it is a very small area this area it's 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 this big very small and these are the the costa i'm, I'm cutting the costa right and these are the uh, these are the pectoralis muscles okay so between the costa there are blood vessels this that there's connective tissue we cannot differentiate it with ultrasound and this is the pleural lining actually so the lung is here so the thorax wall is here this is the wall right so when the patient is breathing the lung is supposed to go up and down as the lungs are actually uh, sliding using the pleural line right so when there is pneumothorax because the wall is actually sticking to the other pleura like you can see a little bit of a movement but when there is pneumothorax like because there is free air inside the thoracic cavity the sliding movement just disappears okay so let's check uh, so let's check it here here if you can faintly detect there is some small movement which is sliding left on right um, I don't know if you are detecting it. Here is, a, here, is, here is another image. We are seeing the costa here. And we are looking at from the intercostal space. And the pleura is moving left and right faintly. Okay. Um, this is when you look at it with a convex probe. It's much more difficult. So you should use a tyroid probe for this. So when there is when you're looking at the image and you don't see anything sliding, then there is pneumothorax. So let's let's check it a little bit carefully if we can see it. I'm seeing the pleura, but there is nothing moving behind it. This is pneumothorax. So I'll check. I'll, I'll send you a normal image. This is normal. Like in a normal image, you see something sliding.
in a in a pneumothorax case you don't see anything sliding it just it just sits still the ultrasound machines have something called m mode and if you check the m mode uh, in in a normal pleura because the pleura is moving it it gives you a sandy appearance but uh, in a case with pneumothorax it really shows really straight lines and these lines rarely change uh, like this is the way they are going to teach you on certification like you can learn it like this but in my opinion the previous method is better uh, that's pretty much it uh, we can look at the there are a lot as we are looking at the other examples like we will it will be better understood uh, because our eyes need to like train themselves okay uh, there are a few of negative cases for uh, fast examination uh, which is not a perfect scan one important thing is that you you can hardly detect solid organ injuries when there is not bleeding like when there's when there's for example some sup uh, subcapsular hematoma like there is some hematoma inside the liver but the capsule is intact so there is no free fluid like it doesn't bleed outside because so it stays contained inside the liver and it's hard for you to see for in the inexperienced people also a lot of other things that can happen in a trauma case they do not show up uh, for example mesenteric vascular injuries you're not checking the blood, uh, blood vessels at all and you are not checking the intestines because the intestines cannot show up on ultrasound, right? Like uh, you are checking all the solid organs, but you are not checking around the pancreas. So you are not checking very carefully the retroperitoneal area. So these are uh, big disadvantages of uh, eFast scan. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, when there is major bleeding, like these are claimed disadvantages of fast scan, but you in a fast scan you do it right next to the patient when you can do it when you are doing a cpr to the patient so it's actually a very like you can do it anywhere and you don't lose time when you're taking the patient to a ct scan and waiting there and coming back also when there is vital like when there's a lot of bleeding it shows for example uh, like in this case for example uh, there is liver here and on the top of the liver we are seeing a very big amount of bleeding like this is hard to miss something uh, also another case when there's pleural fluid the lungs start to swim inside this uh, fluid density and uh, the uh, fluid is contained by the diaphragm uh, when there's a very minute amount of fluid it shows like this uh, like when there is big amount of fluid, it shows like this. But when the fluid is much less, it uh, it's harder to detect. For example, uh, of course. But when there is crazy amount of pericardial fluid, for example, you see it. It is very hard to unsee this kind of. A, uh, and what is important is actually these kind of major bleedings. So when there is a little bit of a bleeding in a cavity, it actually doesn't doesn't really matter for the patient a lot, right? Uh, we have a minute remaining, by the way, uh, for our, uh, let me check. We have some, some 20 slides which are left. So let's make another meeting and go on there. Uh, we are getting a little bit tired, I guess, but there is nothing much left anyway. So, uh, I will be sending you the link in, uh, 320 okay let's make a small five minute break and then go on in the next meeting all right about the piezo crystal and the different frequencies of the probes and uh, the ultrasound fundamental technologies and actually their uh, shortcomings as well uh, like this artifact here right uh, we are seeing color mode and grayscale mode in ultrasound. In fast CT lectures, they are going to tell you to check the pneumothorax using M mode. Uh, I won't be teaching you this. Uh, let's 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 check if you can see it, if you want it or if you would like it or not. 
then we started the case review using the ultrasound uh, in an emergency setting. Uh, we are start speaking about the EFAST examination. Let's forget about FAST for now. Uh, in EFAST examination, we are checking the five areas, which are around the uh, perihepatic area, around the liver, perisplenic area, around the spleen, uh, subcuspid area for pericardial, and suprapubic area for pelvic fluid. Uh, and the uh, anterior chest walls for pneumothorax, left and the right side, because they can mix, right? Uh, one thing I would like to, you to not to forget is, uh, these are pericardial fluids, by the way. When you're looking at around the liver, for example, you are checking the right upper quadrant. Uh, please don't forget to check around the kidney. All right, because there can be free fluid around the kidney as well, because kidneys are retroperitoneal, right? They are not inside the peritoneum, like they are not free fluid, they are not floating inside. They are inside the retroperitoneal wall. So when there's fluid inside, it will be around the kidney, just like uh, here in this case. Uh, here in this case, there is very, very little amount of fluid, so it is very hard to detect. But anyway, it will not, it will hardly go around the liver, it would stay in the retroperitoneal area. So these are in different spaces, although they are right next to each other. Okay. The same goes for perisplenic area as well. Like when there is free fluid around the kidney, it is, it stays around the kidney. It doesn't go around the spleen because it is one is inside the peritoneum, the other is behind the peritoneum. In this case, there was free fluid inside the pleura. So when you're checking the quadrants, we check the solid organ, we check the kidney, and we also check the pleura as well. And uh, there was free fluid around the spleen in this case. This time, free fluid inside the pleura cavity. Around the spleen, it looks like this. It covers the spleen. When it is inside the pleura, it looks different, right? Um, we started recording, by the way, right? <laughs> We saw the recording. Okay, yes, we do. When you look at the, when we check the bladder, it looks like this. Uh, usually the bladder, uh, on the top of the bladder, there's bowel walls. Uh, around the bowel walls, there is not supposed to be any fluid, uh, less than one centimeter at least. And when there's free fluid in the pelvic cavity, it looks like this. The bowels start to swim inside the fluid. Uh, these were the five areas. This can make a very good uh, exam question. Like I, I, I asked this question, by the way. Uh, when you are checking at the pleura, it was something quite difficult. Uh, you need to see it in a few more cases just to see, uh, just to get your eyes uh, used to it. Uh, the pleura is usually sliding right and left uh, between the pleural lines. When there's pneumothorax, because the the, the lung pleura is going to be separated, so this sliding movement will disappear. Okay. Just like in this case, for example, there is no sliding movement. Like the, the dots are uh, staying there, right? So there was a few. Uh, this was the case that I'm going to teach you on uh, on the certification. So there, there are a few downsides of FAST examination, and these are also very important. So to use FAST, you have to be in a very dire situation. Like when you don't have a CT and you have only ultrasound, this, this is the only thing you can do. And, and the patient is very unstable, so you cannot take it to a CT scan, you make an EFAST examination. When you are making a CPR to the patient, so you cannot take it to the CT scanner, obviously, you make a FAST scan. Okay. What it cannot detect? is also important. Uh, things like small bowel injuries, for example, or mesenteric vascular injuries. We are not looking at these things. Like It's impossible to see them. Also, intestinal injuries, for example, because there is intestines are very hard to uh, evaluate with ultrasound, as we have talked, the reasons why. Uh, we cannot see any intestinal injury. Also, uh, we are looking at the retroperitoneum only to kidneys, around kidneys. So we are not checking the pancreas, right? We are not checking around 
the aorta, for example. Like you can check, by the way, but it is not inside the EFAST routine. All right, EFAST is only five areas. But when there is a lot of bleeding, I told you guys that it is not very, very difficult to see that. Okay, when there is a lot of fluid inside, when the lung is really swimming inside it, you will detect it. Also, uh, this was a case of uh, uh, pericardial uh, fluid. So solid organ injuries are also very hard to detect. Like in this case, this is the CT scan of the same patient, okay? We are seeing uh, fluid around the kidney. Uh, if Maybe it is hard to detect for you for the first case, but you, are, you can obviously see the kidneys are not looking symmetrical, right? Like one in, in left kidney, around the kidney, there is only fat. But around here, there is this uh, thick line of fluid. In ultrasound, it shows like this. So, like when you are doing 10 ultrasounds, like you can easily detect the, in, in, after the 10 ultrasound, you can easily detect uh, perirenal uh, bleeding as well. Uh, this, was, uh, this was another patient with uh, renal laceration, for example. Uh, the, 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 the kidney actually tear down, there's free bleeding uh, inside the retroperitoneal space. So uh, we, we came to the questions part. Uh, can anybody come up with a diagnosis for this patient? You can just guess, by the way. Is it a fluid around the lung or something? There is like? there is some fluid around the lung, right? Yeah, the lung is swimming. The the liver is not swimming, right? The liver is staying there around the liver. Maybe there's fluid around the liver too, like we are not seeing because we didn't see the down downside of the liver. But there is no free fluid around the liver under the diaphragm. But above the diaphragm, there is a lot of fluid, right? The lungs start to swim inside this area. Fluid. Well, some might have a can we know by ultrasonography that this fluid has contained blood or not? Is this bleeding or just a fluid with no blood? Uh, yeah, actually, yes. Actually, yes. A good question, by the way. Uh, when there is when there is like serous, uh, serious, uh, like a seroma, uh, when there is not bleeding, uh, because seroma has a lower density, like there is lower content of seroma, right? Inside seroma, there is barely any cells. There is just some a little bit of protein and basically water, right? So uh, it looks pretty much all dark, like in this image. It's a quite a dark image. When it's a blood, actually, it shows a little bit more heterogeneous. Uh, please excuse me for a minute. Yeah, Beshomlik. Beshomlik. So there is, uh, when there is serious, uh, not serious, seroma, uh, like low density fluid, it shows very dark. When there is blood, it shows like a little bit more grayish and more heterogeneous. This was a nice question. By the way, these things which are flying around are small septa, like, uh, anyway, not important. <laughs> Any more questions? Let's move on to the next case then. Can no, I, no, I, 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 I have a, a question about the, sure. uh, for the previous case. Sure. You told us that raccoon eyes, and I feel like rac isn't raccoon eyes tell us that this patient has uh, intracranial, intracranial bleeding, like yeah, sure. bleeding. Sure, yeah. So, we cannot use ultrasonography for intracranial yeah, sure. bleeding. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course. So, yeah. If the so, patient has raccoon eyes, like I was just, it was just a question for you to see what you would do, right? Like it was, it was a question of ABC, and I was trying to uh, like give an example of a typical case of a trauma, right? Because in a typical case of trauma, there is multiple traumas actually. When the, when the patient is falling from the third floor. There is not only one fracture, but a lot of fractures usually. So, uh, yeah, you cannot detect any intracranial bleeding with ultrasound through that. Was it clear? 
Okay, we came to the next case. Uh, can anybody differentiate what we are seeing now? Uh, I'm waiting. Is it the bladder? Yeah, that's the bladder, right? That's the right bladder. Uh, that's just uh, a normal bladder, looking like a normal bladder. Okay. And the probe is right here. Uh, probe is here. So it looks like a CT scan, right? It looks much like a CT scan, like, like everything is much more symmetric. Okay, good one. Can anybody come up with something on this one? Is that the uterus? Please try to guess. Sorry. Is that the uterus? That's the uterus, right? Okay, good one. Yeah. Good one. That's the, the uterus. Yeah, yeah, these are the round ligaments yeah. which are uh, connecting yes. it to the uh, to the sides of the abdominal cavity, and we are seeing the endometrial line. The ovaries are here also as well, and we are seeing the bowels as well, right? So yeah. what we are seeing in this patient, uh, ma'am, yeah. we are seeing a lot of fluid inside the abdomen, right? There's a lot of fluid. Okay. Um, Very... I have a question, doctor. Sure. Um, is free fluid always a bad thing or is just that the amount of fluid that differentiates between how bad it gets? Uh, yeah, we can see free fluid around as one centimeter in case, uh, especially when the patient is uh, between their periods. Like we see a lot of free fluid in women, actually. Right between the two periods, actually, there is this yeah. time of ovulation. But that's normal. Yeah, like, because as you remember, when the patient is ovulating, it's actually a little bit of bleeding as well, right? So yeah. because the cyst is the cyst is rupturing, right? Yeah. So it happens, like it happens, but uh, yes. like less than one centimeter, we don't pay much care. And it is hard to detect an ultrasound, of course. Also, okay. all right. We have seen this patient. Can you come up with the diagnosis? This is free flow inside the abdomen. This is a pelvic view, right? We are seeing the bladder here, which is contain, which contains the contained fluid, and we are seeing the free fluid, which is running around the uh, peritoneal organs, right? Uh, let's check this one. This was a harder case. So, uh, did anybody notice anything? Isn't this the bladder? Yeah, this is just the bladder. Well, it isn't, it isn't just the bladder in the view. Uh, this is the bladder, right? It's round, it's contained, it's got fluid inside. Well, let me pause the screen. And what about these ones? Sorry. What about these areas? Because the bladder was here, right? Bladder was here. It is because the patient is, because the doctor is actually moving the probe now up and down like it's coming in and out actually but uh, let's look at the uh, animation again so we are seeing the bladder but around the bladder we are seeing dark fluid and we are barely seeing the uh, bowels uh, moving inside it as well right okay another case We are taking the bets. Anyone? So let's evaluate here. All right. What's this one? Okay, people, what's this one? This, this one is kidney, right? Um, yeah, what's this? This probably this probably liver or or spleen. So this is the body wall. So around around the liver or spleen we are seeing free fluid. Okay. Because it bled and like bleeding can go anywhere. It can go like this is the diaphragm here and there is the lungs here right the lungs are here so when there's free fluid in the pleura it 
pushes the lung. And when there is fluid under the diaphragm, like it can swim anywhere. It can go like this, or it can go here or accumulate on the dome of the liver as well. So let's check the animation again. We are seeing the lower pole of the kidney. And this is either liver or spleen. So around the liver, we are seeing a little bit of it. This is this is a little bit pathologic. Okay, it's it's more than a centimeter in my opinion. All right. Uh, another case. What do you think? Are we uh, seeing the lungs swimming in this case? Uh, by the way, you can be wrong. Like we are, we are accepting su suggestions from anyone. So we are seeing the diaphragm here, okay? And the lungs are not swimming because when there is lungs swimming, it's usually the fluid is like this. I can see the diaphragm here, and the lungs usually have very sharp borders, right? And they are swimming. This time. We are seeing the dome of the diaphragm, but the fluid, uh, you are recognizing this is fluid, right? So this is free fluid. But it's basically under the diaphragm, right? So uh, what this can be? Never. Sorry? Liver, liver, I mean... Yeah, liver or spleen. Yeah, liver or spleen, right? One of the both. Probably liver because it's bigger. Because it's bigger, this is probably liver. So this is around the liver but under the diaphragm, right? If this was below, uh, above the diaphragm, it was, it would be something different. It would be pleural for it this time. All right. Uh, okay, please remember the areas that we are checking in an EFS examination. Please don't forget. Uh, also, the ultrasound can be it can be used in many cases. Uh, there are a lot of other uses of ultrasound in emergency. Uh, the the most re important ones, like the most common ones, are the evaluation of the collecting systems of the kidneys. Uh, it can be easily visualized. Uh, so uh, this is a normal uh, kidney. Uh, this one, the the collective system of the liver, uh, sorry, the kidneys are usually collapsed, so you don't see any canal system. But when there is something obstructing the view, then obstructing the flow, sorry, uh, when there is something obstructing the flow, then it gets, it starts to get dilated, right, uh, because of the uh, pressure of the uh, neurosynthesized uh, urine. So in this case, uh, for example, we are seeing the collecting system totally get dilated and afterwards the collecting system is uh, we don't see the collecting system there is collapse there and we are seeing the stone here there's a stone here and it's actually making a shadow just like the shadow we have seen on gallbladder stone do you remember i'm deleting all this so let's see we see the kidney stone here we see the dilated uh, uh, canal systems and the kidney stone which is blocking the view so kidney stones above five millimeters are very easy to uh, detect with also ultrasound when they get smaller like two three millimeters they're harder to detect actually uh, that's another case with a, a collecting system dilatation let me try to see anything like a kidney stone i'm not detecting anything uh, in this case where is the probe Buyurun. please here Sorry. Where is the place here in this in, to see this view in the kidney? Sorry. I mean, where do we put the probe? The probe, yeah, I need to see this. Uh, okay. This okay. View. Mm. Can you see my drawing? Yeah. All right. Yeah, you put the probe here. Here. Yeah. These are diaphragms, these are hearts. OK. 
Okay. When you look at the image from from the lateral lateral side, uh, then you're just uh, just looking at the image with the uh, with it's just like fast examination actually. So you're putting it to the lateral side of the patient, and you can see the kidneys from here. All right. Oh, this is another patient, and uh, this time we are the, kid, the kidney stone is it's quite big, quite big actually. So it cannot go down the ureter, uh, ureter and stay uh, in the outlet of the renal pelvis. And uh, one very classical use of ultrasound in emergency is also gallbladder stones uh, and uh, evaluation of cholecystitis. The cholecystitis is it's a very common disease. Like and uh, it's so common, like you don't pay attention to that. You don't, if we don't really care about it, looks like we don't care about it. But it can easily kill a patient. Okay, it's a very severe disease. It starts with uh, obstruction of the uh, gallbladder. When these, there are a lot of patients with kidney stones. Nearly, by the way, 20 percent, around 20 percent of people have kidney and uh, gallbladder stones. Uh, but most of them do not caused any kind any problem but when some of these stones get impacted in the uh, outlet of the gallbladder it obstructs the group and the, the bile is it's 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 actually not sterile like it's not very infected but it's never sterile unlike uh, the renal system so when you obstruct the gallbladder it very easily gets infected and when it gets infected it gets distended because it has edema. The wall gets thickened, okay, and the uh, the axis of the uh, gallbladder is uh, it increases. It increases more than four centimeters, okay. So there are a few signs for us to detect the uh, cholecystitis in using the ultrasound, which is the distension of the uh, gallbladder. And uh, the Murphy sign also, we can check it with ultrasound uh, when we are using uh, the, uh, when we are making the examination. When you see the gallbladder and you push uh, and you push the probe, when, when if the patient is sensitive about it, it's also an important sign. And the bubble wall, uh, sorry, gallbladder wall thickening is also important. So this is how a gallbladder normally looks like. It looks like the gallbladder we see on CT, right? It's not very distended. It is very long and narrow, actually. When it gets very round and the, bowl, uh, the wall is increasing in size, uh, we should be suspecting cholecystitis. This is also a typical case of cholecystitis. It is distended. Like I should measure this. I don't have a measure with me, but uh, it's probably close to four centimeters. And the wall is thickened also. One other important thing is there is condensing, condensing of the bile inside it. When it is condensed, it is also suspected. And we are seeing small stones inside gallbladder. In this image, I don't see the outlet of the gallbladder. So, but if I look at it, there is probably something obstructing the uh, outlet. All right. So uh, when you're seeing the gallbladder distended and the stone gets impacted on the outlet, you see acute cholecystitis. But there is a case called chronic cholecystitis, where the bladder is the gallbladder is uh, pretty much collapsed, so there is no distension. So basically, there is no obstruction, but the wall is very thick. Uh, this happens because because of repetitive cases of acute cholecystitis happening and relapsing, so the the gallbladder gets becomes something which is indistendable and inf chronically inflamed. Uh, that is the basic uh, pathology behind chronic cholecystitis. Okay, uh, we passed this image. Let me come back to that. Uh, usually, the uh, sometimes also the the gallbladder stones are so small they look like some sand and they uh, create some level inside the gallbladder this is also common so uh, we should always remember that behind the pathology behind acute cholecystitis is uh, obstruction okay within the pathology behind chronic cholecystitis i think i, I made a big mistake there the pathology behind 
acute cholecystitis obstruction. The pathology behind chronic cholecystitis is uh, sustained inflammation, repetitive inflammation. So there are numerous other cases of use of ultrasound, for example. You can check the aorta, you can check the uh, bile ducts, uh, you can check the blood vessels, uh, there is numerous causes, but uh, this will be the basic thing that you need to uh, be uh, learning uh, in this course, and I will be asking in this course. Uh, I will be sending uh, everybody 